Hello listeners, it's Adrian here from Market Attack and today I've got another super guest on the show. He was involved in one of my favourite games of all time, probably my second favourite point and click adventure. So sorry, no, not quite number one for me, but it's up there. Um, I'm talking about Fate of Atlantis and we've got Noah Falstein here. What a legend. So thank you, Noah, for your time today. You're very welcome. Glad to be here. Brilliant. Um, I'd love to start at the beginning, though, because I, I, I assume, well, not assume, but the, the bulk of interview is going to be pretty based around your time at LucasArts, a legendary company. But I'd love to know how you kind of got into the video game industry and kind of what you were doing before then, and if you can sort of recall maybe the first ever game you ever worked on. Sure. Well, I guess it's, um, I mean, it was a gradual thing. I, I was always a, a game player from, you know, as long as I can remember. Uh, I have an older brother and sister and would play games, you know, often more sophisticated games with them, even when I was four or five years old and, and kind of got hooked on it that way. But this was way before, you know, even video games were out there. Um, but I, I loved games and then uh, I learned how to, to program uh, also fairly early on for, for somebody in those days. It was in the, the 70s and I was very lucky to have a, a school that had a Fortran programming class but it was um, punch cards and it was it was really tedious and awful compared to you know anything that came after that and it kind of turned me off to computers and i thought well this is not at all like the science fiction i'm reading it's just not going to work but what turned it around for me is that uh, i went to a college called uh, hampshire college in western massachusetts that lets you design your own curriculum and it's very innovative and my first semester there I was taking a calculus class and our calculus teacher said, you know, math is great, but these days if you really want to do math uh, or use it in your career, you should learn computers. And he recommended a, a computer programming course in a language called APL that was popular at the time. And the teacher for that uh, basically introduced us to some Star Trek uh, computer games on the mainframe there. And this was in 1975, so I kind of got hooked uh, on playing computer games and very quickly started rewriting some of the ones I didn't like. You know, basically I, I would find a game that was fun, but there were things that I thought would be better. And I learned how to actually change the code or in some cases just rewrite the whole game from scratch because they were pretty simple at the time. And that's really what got me going. Uh, my first professional job though was right after graduation from university there it would have been um, early 1980. I got a job at Milton Bradley uh, company. It was better known at the time for its um, uh, jigsaw puzzles, but they had something that even to this day is still popular called Simon. It's just a, a little um, circular sort of flying saucer with four different colors and, you know, plays a, a different tune each um, uh, of the four quadrants you press. And um, in fact, it was it was featured in the, the Silicon Valley TV series pretty prominently, which tickled me. And Milton Bradley was my my launching pad into professional game design, uh, and you know just kind of kept on going from there. So it's it's really it's been forty years now, and uh, haven't looked back. That's astonishing. I think I know it's MB Games. Is that right, uh, Milton Bradley? Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. They, that's correct. And they've been bought by Hasbro subsequently, but I think right. they kept the label. That's great. So obviously, I mean, I, when I think of it, MB games, I think of the board games. Are you a fan of board games yourself? or are you, is Oh, yeah, always, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I've got a, a whole stack of them and, you know, loved board games uh, as a kid. Play, you know, I love the renaissance and uh, games over the last 10 years that everyone's playing. Brilliant. Um, I've got to ask them because obviously you're working in that sort of industry already, but how did you get the chance to work at LucasArts? Right? I assume it was LucasFilm games back then. Um, and you were one of the earliest um, members of the team, weren't you? Is that right? Yeah, I was. I was among the first ten, um, and it was, in fact, uh, I guess what we'd call a stealth startup these days. In that, Lucasfilm was just huge at the time because the impact of Star Wars was amazing, and the Indiana Jones movies had started to come out, and it's a little hard to to compare it today because. There are so many, um, you know, big budget special effects movies, but back then it was really uh, head and shoulders, you know, the kind of coolest place for, at least for a nerd to be. And I had no idea that they were making games. In fact, they hadn't launched their first games when they uh, contacted me. 
And it was really, <clears throat> excuse me, just coincidental that I had a friend who was also a game designer who had a um, recruiter uh, approach her for a job at Lucasfilm Games. And she used me as a reference and they interviewed me about her, decided uh, at the time that they you know, probably uh, weren't ready to take her on. Um, but I had the name and phone number of David Fox, who had been the person who had uh, interviewed me about it. And about five or six months after that, because of the crash in the video game market, I, I was working on uh, uh, coin-operated games for Williams Electronics. I had just done something called Sinistar, and um, the the numbers were just diving. You know, they lost about ninety percent of their revenue from one year to another from '84, and laid off a bunch of us. Um, the whole industry did. It was it was a big crash of the arcade industry. And uh, I called up David to see if they had any other openings, and it turned out that they actually were just doing some hiring, and it went on from there. I uh, came out for some interviews, and and that was it. That's amazing. We've we've had David Fox. He was our first actual interview interviewee actually on our podcast. Um, oh, and he's a great, what, what a gentleman he is actually. As I'm sure oh, he's great. great guy. Yeah, we've stayed close friends. Actually, we we live about a ten minute drive apart and see each other frequently. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. Um. I, I assume your role at LucasArts sort of changed quite a, few, a bit over the years over there, but how would you describe your exact role? What's your responsibilities? Well, the the title that um, evolved uh, was project leader, which was a, meant a special thing there. It was really a, a, a pretty uh, high responsibility in that you were the lead designer, the manager of the project, I guess you'd be the producer today, um, but also the lead programmer. And this came out of the fact that in the early 80s, often games were a one person thing. And even though LucasArts, uh, Lucasfilm Games was already doing games as teams, they were very small teams of just often two or three people. So you would have you know major responsibility on the project leader. And, uh, it was, uh, you know, a, a exhilarating to have that much control, but it was also um, it, it pushed you, you know, quite a bit. We had to kind of teach ourselves a lot of what was going on as we we went through there. Not only um, certainly a lot of game design issues we worked out collaboratively. It was a very collaborative group of people, and we would all sit uh, or or stand in, in the courtyard uh, of the building we were at. And just chat for hours about design concepts and and you know meta concepts of you know what it meant to be a good game designer. Uh, so we kind of taught ourselves as we went along because it was so early on in the industry. Oh, brilliant! And as I mentioned, we've we've spoken to David Fox in the past, Brett Mogilevsky, James Purple Hampton. We had, we had a lot of um, fellow LucasArts mm -hmm. people in text interviews as yourself earlier as well. Um, I mean. You, you actually said in the text interview, one, one of the biggest or the proudest moments of your time there was the people you hired or helped hire for LucasArts. Uh, do you mind going into a bit more detail about that and what that sort of led to? Sure. Well, there, there are sort of two, um, you know, almost uh, ancestral family trees, I think, that I helped start there and that um, I hired Ron Gilbert uh, as the Commodore 64 programmer on my Coronas Rift game. And uh, Ron, we had, I think, four candidates, and he was clearly the best of the, the four, but very modest, very um, uh, self-effacing, you know, and, and I think he was shocked that we actually hired him, and it was, it was really flattering that excited about it. And uh, Ron went on to hire... Uh, Tim Schaefer and Dave Grossman to work on the Monkey Island games and, you know, a whole bunch of people to work on our adventure game line. So uh, even though it was, you know, totally Ron's uh, uh, initiative that that made a lot of that so special, I like the fact that, you know, I mean, the fact that, of course, David Fox hired me, so he's kind yeah. of a grandfather that way. Um, but I also, uh, on uh, a subsequent game, um, Actually, which one was it? Was it, uh, oh, it was PHM Pegasus uh, uh, Hydrofoil game. I hired Larry Holland as a contract worker. And Larry went on, uh, we worked together 
on a World War II flight simulator line. We had um, uh, Battle Hawks 1942. We had their finest hour, the Battle of Britain, and secret weapons of the Luftwaffe. But Larry's best known for then, after those games, taking a lot of what we did for World War II fighter planes and adapting it to do X-Wing and TIE Fighter and, and that whole line. And uh, I, in fact, I was pleased to see TIE Fighter uh, that came out in, I think, what would it have been, uh, 1980, sorry, 1992 or 1994, something like that, just was listed as one of the top three or four uh, Star Wars uh, space combat games. And... Uh, just, you know, nice to have been able to bring in people who went on to kind of eclipse me. And of course, uh, Tim Schaefer is such a big name these days. It's, it's great to remember, you know, when his uh, CV came around and we were all passing it around because it was incredibly creative. And uh, he was uh, relatively inexperienced at the time, but he was clearly so good at humor that we, we had to have him in for an interview and he won us over when we did. What, what, what was his CV like? Then? Did he add jokes and things to it, or how did it, how did well, it stand he, out? He's actually published it on uh, the Double Fine website. I think if you dig around, you could find it with a little bit of Googling. Uh, but he did a cartoon, basically, that uh, showed him coming into interview and his, you know, how excited he was. And if I remember correctly, it kind of it, it showed two endings of him being brokenhearted and desolate that he didn't get the job and on top of the world if he did. But it was in his characteristic uh, sort of tongue-in-cheek silly uh, humor style that he's so good at. And it was so much the kind of humor that Ron was looking for for the, the game he was working on that we, you know, were persuaded. I mean, at that point, we, were, we had our proprietary um, language we were using to make the graphic adventures. And uh, we had to teach people how to use that in the beginning. So nobody was coming in knowing how to do that. So there was a lot of instruction involved and we figured that that would work out and it certainly did. That's amazing. I mean, LucasArts, um, no, when I, when I was growing up, it's one of those few companies where I thought any game you get with, with that logo on it is gonna be quality. And um, I don't think I've played any game that didn't meet those really high standards for me personally. I mean, how, speaking to people in the past, when I'd love to get your view. It's, it had a special sort of feel into it, the company. Um, but what attributes do you think you needed in that company, maybe in these sort of really early days at least, to, to make it so successful? And at least, but, yeah, what, what's the magic ingredients in your view? You know, I, I've wondered about that. And in fact, our, our we're, many of us are still close friends. You know, I, I talked to, uh, you know, people like uh, David Fox, Ron Gilbert, Hal Barwood, um, uh, Tim Schaefer, uh, Dave Grossman, all those people I've talked to within the, the last month uh, or communicated with. And um, uh, we didn't realize at the time how unusual it was that we had such a great group of people that fit in so well. And I have to attribute a lot of that to the early hiring and the, the uh, uh, there was a, a I think, an interest in getting people who were nice people who who liked to get along. It wasn't just that, you know, I've been at some companies since then where somebody is a fantastic programmer, but they're kind of a jerk and, you know, people put up with it because they're so good at coding. Um, and we, we had a little bit of trouble in the very early days, but uh, fairly quickly kind of sorted out how to hire people that got along well together. But I would say the main thing was just the ascendancy of Lucasfilm as this creative icon of exactly the kind of people that we wanted to hire. And it meant that we really got our pick of, you know, a huge number of applications for any kind of opening we had. And I've since had a similar experience with, you know, some other companies when I was one of the first uh, few people at DreamWorks Interactive and uh, at Google, for example, it's the same thing that if you have the reputation where there are, you know, dozens or, I remember at Google, we actually had, um, I think they get 140 resumes for each person that they actually hire. Uh, so you, you can imagine you can be incredibly selective. And uh, we didn't have as good a ratio of that, I think, at Lucasfilm, but uh, it certainly attracted the people who were most like the ones we wanted to hire. I mean, it was the, the movies themselves, the Star Wars movies in particular, uh, almost 
every person in the company was just a huge fan of, of Star Wars, uh, as you might expect. But, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily work that way in other companies that um, a lot of game companies now have people who uh, actually don't even like to play games, but they're really good at art. They're really good at, at marketing and, you know, they'll sell anything that they, they come across. In our case, for the kind of creativity that was embodied in the Star Wars and Indiana Jones movies. We're talking about those two franchises, the EQ, arguably the biggest movies, you know, the, the really massive movies there. Uh, George Lucas well, and Steven Spielberg were involved in both of those. Did you did you work closely with both of those gentlemen? And uh, obviously huge, huge legends in the industry, but what were they like to work with? Any funny stories about them or? Sure, well, I was very lucky um, in that I was the first project leader on The Dig and uh, I was it was first of four, uh, but because I was the first one, uh, well, it, it was based on an idea that came from Steven Spielberg. And George was generally incredibly supportive, but not very personally interested in video games. Uh, so he would spend maybe literally, I think, oh, five or six hours every year uh, coming over to our group. You know, there'd be one or two visits of just a few hours each uh, spread out over the course of a year. And he would meet with our, our boss more often, but in terms of actually coming in and talking to the people making the games, just wasn't his thing. You know, he would yeah. hang out at ILM quite a bit and work on the films, of course. Stephen, however, uh, was, and as far as I know, still is a huge video game fan. Um, and it, when he came in with this idea for The Dig, uh, George wanted to get involved in it because it's, they're, they've been good friends for, you know, forever. And so I got to be uh, the project leader who led those creative meetings. And we did, I uh, think it was only two or three that had both George and Stephen in them. And then uh, uh, separate ones with, with Stephen because he was the one who was so excited about it. But uh, it was a huge thrill for me to actually not only be in the meeting with them, but be charged with running a creative meeting with these two guys that uh, the first time I was so nervous about it that, uh, you know, I just didn't know what to expect. But they were, uh, particularly Stephen, I think, is so much like other game designers I know. He's got exactly the kind of creative personality. And both of these guys were just like us in the sense that they would throw out lots of ideas and some were good and some were bad, but their hit ratio was fantastic. And of course, anything involving story and character development, they were, you know, blowing us away. So it was, uh, it was pretty amazing. And as far as anecdotes, um, oh, there were, there were a lot of really interesting things that came out of those meetings. Uh, I mean, I guess, my favorite uh, story is Stephen, you know, as I said, George would, would often not be all that uh, interested in what we were doing. And ILM, you know, took up all of his attention. We had a, a group meeting on the dig <clears throat> that they were both involved with one morning. And uh, I remember specifically, it was supposed to start at nine in the morning. And uh, Stephen was flying up from Los Angeles, but as often happens, there was a lot of fog in the San Francisco airport, so they delayed the flight. And he didn't actually get to Skywalker Ranch where we were until 9.50. So it was 10 minutes before our long meeting was supposed to end. And I thought, great, you know, because we had been told at, at 10 o'clock he had a meeting with ILM. And we, I thought, great, we'll get 10 minutes. He'll blow us off and talk to ILM. But in fact, we went on for the full hour and even a bit more. And a lot of it, I think, because he was so excited. Meanwhile, in the next room over, ILM was setting up and they were going to be showing off um, clips of some of the dinosaurs for Jurassic Park. So, you know, yeah. certainly something I would expect Stephen to be really excited to dive in and see. So we finish our meeting. Uh, there to, you know, get us out of there and, and have him over. So we start to pack up the computer and chatting a little bit about things. And he asked us about those flight simulators that I mentioned before. Uh, and I think it was probably uh, our Battle of Britain game that was happening at the time. I don't recall which one it was, but he mentioned something about, you know, how's that going? And I said, oh, well, we had a, a demo, but, you know, of course we ran out of time. And he said, oh, you have a demo? And I said, well, it's on the computer, but, you know, we've already started. Could you set it up again? And behind him, I could see the head ILM guy. 
And he literally rolled his eyes and was like, oh, God, not more delay. Yeah. Um, but he had us set up the computer again, spent another 20 minutes delaying the ILM meeting so he could play the, the flight sim. And, you know, that was that was such a high point for me to see that he loved our game so much to, to put all that stuff aside. That's incredible. That is a great story, isn't it? Oh, wow. <laughs> That's about, I mean, two amazing legends there. But yeah, Stephen, wow, proper gamer it sounds. Um, we'll talk more about the dig later. No, if that's all right. I'm going to kind of go in sure. chronological order, I think. But I, I've got to ask, actually, Monkey Island, you know, I think it's just literally celebrating, I was about to say it's 30th anniversary, the, the original Monkey Island game. Um, is it true that you were involved in the sword fighting mechanics, the infamous insult sword fighting? Is that a, a myth or is there some truth in that? Oh, no, no, this is quite true. I mean, it's it's interesting because my memory of it, and uh, I've, I've talked to uh, Ron and Tim and Dave about it, and one of the things we realize is that, you know, after 30 years, it's amazing how uh, fuzzy a lot of the memories can get. And, and in some cases, there have been things that I was sure happened or didn't happen that I was able to then look up and realize I was totally wrong. But I remember the the key genesis moment for me on that was uh and I've, I've i've mentioned this story before so it's in more detail for anybody who wants to search online but uh ultimately so what had happened is that ron and david fox and i had collaborated on indiana jones and the last crusade that you know came out before monkey island and we had needed a um uh, uh punching a, a, a boxing mechanic for that game and I had been playing Sid Meier's Pirates game and they had a pirate sword fighting mechanic where you could basically, uh, it was a 2D side scrolling thing and you could you know, stab high, medium or low and move back and forth. And it was kind of a, a very simple fencing mechanic. And I thought, well, if we change that to fists, it will work for boxing. But I didn't tell Ron that I had basically ripped off the idea when you know, we built that in. And he's working on Monkey Island and he came to me and I, so the, the part that I remember very clearly, he, he said, yeah, I, I had this insight that your, your boxing mechanic would work great for pirate sword fighting. So I thought I'd just replace the boxing gloves with swords. And I thought, oh crap, you know, I'm going to be found out because everyone's <laughs> going to say it's derivative of pirates. So I confessed that to Ron and, and here's where it, it gets a little fuzzy in that uh, we and, and the rest of the team, I think, talked about alternatives. And I remember suggesting uh, that in a lot of the movies that Ron had had us watch uh, leading up to it, and uh, the Errol Flynn pirate movies from the 1930s, uh, but also The Princess Bride is one of the, the major ones that had the kind of humor we were after. A lot of the fighting involved the people insulting each other, and there always were these scenes in the movies where the two of them would have their swords crossed and their faces inches apart, which is ridiculous, but it was a chance for them to kind of spit insults at each other from inches away. And it hit me that maybe that was the key to what we should do, and I suggested the, the basic mechanic. Um, it developed quite a bit from there, and uh, Orson Scott Card, the science fiction writer, actually came in and wrote some of the insults. And, and I believe he was the one that came up with the technique that we used in the game where the sword master has a totally different set of insults, a uh, different set of rejoinders actually on the same insults. And that was something that I thought was a, a brilliant addition. Um, but my memory is just from that, that pang of fear of being discovered as a plagiarist uh, to realize that we had to come up with something different. So I'm, I'm confident that at least that that germ of it was uh, my idea. And we collaborated a lot, even though I wasn't um, a full member of the team. I'm, I'm on the credits for the first two Monkey Island games because our, our offices were all close together and we would come over and take a look over each other's shoulders and make suggestions constantly. I'm one of the biggest fans of Monkey Island. I mean, you must reflect back. It's amazing, isn't it? 30 years, I can't believe it. Um, oh, yeah, it's it's incredible. And it's it's amazing how alive it is in the, the minds of fans, including a lot of people who weren't even born when the game came out, but have fallen in love with it since then. Um, and Last Crusade, you said, was made before Monkey Island. Is that right? So it's... Um, was it late 80s then, is that correct? It came out uh, the same year the movie did, uh, 89. So, wow. in fact, Ron put Monkey Island aside uh, in order to to work uh, together with David and I on, on The Last Crusade. 
I, I enjoy The Last Crusade. I think it's a good adventure game. Obviously, you, you know the hero already. I was a, always, a, always a fan of Indiana Jones. Um, I would love to know how you actually went about making that game. Did you see the movie before, like test screenings of, of The Last Crusade? Were you given the script? Or were you sort of just... How close is the game to the film, for example? Is it like It's been a few years since I've played it, truthfully. So, well, first of all, I guess to answer the first part of your question, we were given the script in with you know great warnings to keep it totally secret that you know something that was a big deal at the time is that the title of the last crusade was made public early on but the fact that he was after the holy grail was kept secret until the movie came out and uh that in particular we were told you know absolutely it was a firing offense to just you know give out any of that information so we took it quite seriously but uh around that time at, at one point i was talking to the head of um, licensing for Lucasfilm. And I mentioned something about how our games were starting to do better and um, PHM Pegasus that I had done had had broken records for us. I think we sold a quarter million copies, which was great in the mid eighties, but you know, sort of silly now. And uh, I thought, well, this is starting to, you know, I guess we're starting to get some, some a decent income st stream. And he chuckled a bit and I said, it's not that big. And they said, well, I don't want to burst your bubble, but uh, we made more um, on just licensing pajamas with Star Wars characters than the entire games uh, group made, you know, in that previous year. And that really put us in our place, you know. <laughs> it was, uh, uh, so as a consequence, we even though we were making a game based on the movie, the people making the movie just saw the game as you know, number 173 in their list of licensees. You know, may, maybe I'm, I'm exaggerating a bit, but uh, it was it was definitely, we were very low on the list. So we had the script, we had a few still, but we didn't get to go on any of the production shoots. We didn't see any of the early clips. We did see the final film a few weeks before it came out in the theaters. Um, and in fact, they did let the group of us, uh, Ron, Dave, and I, to 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 come down to Paramount Studios to see that uh, for a very special screening. I think there were only 12 of us in the audience. And it was a shock to us because they had actually cut several important scenes out of the movie, well, several scenes that were important to our game. And it was too late for us to change the game at that point. But we had already positioned the game as following the action of the movie, but changing it here and there because we were stuck in that if it was exactly like the movie, you'd know the answer to all the puzzles and, and exactly how it would come out. If it differed too much, people would say, well, this is called The Last Crusade, but it's a totally different story. So we had to find our way to thread through something that, that you know, often what we did was try and fill in the parts in the game that you missed in the movie. Uh, so for example, in the movie, you know that that Indy and his father uh, rush through the the Zeppelin and get on a biplane, and so we made a whole maze inside the Zeppelin that doesn't really exist in the movie. You just see literally a few seconds of them clambering around inside, um, and that's really the the approach we took. But it it was uh, quite a shock for us to see that the the um, scenes that we had included in the game, you know, in some cases were cut from the movie and we decided to turn it into a virtue and marketed the game as having, you know, special scenes cut from the film. And, mm. uh, you know, we just didn't point out that it was inadvertent that we'd been able to do that. That's brilliant. Um, I have to ask, actually, it, I assume you're a fan of the films that uh, before you started working on the games. Is that fair? And oh, do, you have a favorite, do you have a favorite Indiana Jones movie? Well, I would say, I think because of all the time we put into it, and I, I don't know how many times I watched it, The Last Crusade was probably my favorite one. And I thought the Sean Connery, Harrison Ford dynamic was fantastic. Um, I, I wasn't very fond. You know, I, I think the first one, though, Raiders of the Lost, Lost Ark, there were a lot of elements of that, that particularly uh, Marion's character, you know, the all the other movies, uh, well, sorry, the other two movies that had different uh, female um, romance uh, interests, I thought never lived up to you know the 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 quality of what they did in that first one with uh, you know uh, her as Marion. And uh, when we did, I'm sure you get to this, but when Hal and I worked on Fate of Atlantis, 
we wanted a similar strong-willed, competent uh, woman and not somebody who was just either an adversary or following you know, him meekly along. And so I would say certainly, I guess if I ranked it, I would say I, it, it would be a toss up between Last Crusade and, and uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark for my favorite. I don't know, but there might even be a fifth movie. You never know. I don't know if that's been cancelled It's yet, been but... delayed many times, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and I've talked to people um, at Disney about that a bit. Uh, I, I'm not allowed to say any more than that, fair but enough, uh, I'm keeping my fingers crossed. I, frankly, I, given how old uh, Harrison Ford is and given the way Disney works, my totally um, – unofficial uh, uh, theory at this point is that it's more likely that at some point they're going to say, all right, we're just starting over and, you know, we're going to do, we're going to reboot the Indiana Jones franchise in some way because Disney, uh, you know, is very good at remaking stuff and, and revitalizing. And uh, at this point, it's been so difficult getting everybody to, to agree on something. I don't know if it'll ever happen. Fair enough. Um, our listeners can't see it, uh, Noah, but in, the, in your, I can, I, you've got your camera up, I can see in the background in your in your office, a really good movie poster. Well, it looks like a movie poster. It's unbelievably professional, uh, but it's actually the, the the game cover, isn't it, of Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis. Um, we were talking slightly off air earlier. I mean, it's an amazing piece of art, isn't it? It's the game cover, but it's also got uh, credits, uh, like movie credits, and there are a lot of little humorous touches in there, you know, in the fine print. Uh, this was a, a promotional poster that we gave out of. I've also got a Revenge of the Jedi poster up How here. Amazing. That was uh, one of the rare, uh, before they changed the name to Return of the Jedi, they made a few posters that called it Revenge of the Jedi. So I uh, mm -hmm. was able to pick up one of those. Um, but yeah, that was uh, uh, because Hal, um, Hal Barwood had worked on a bunch of movies. Most notably, he was a uh, ghostwriter on, on Stephen's uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Uh, in fact, Hal's even a, um, a bit player at the very end of the movie. They, they have some torpedo bombing squadron pilots come off of the mothership of the aliens, and Hal is one of the first two people that comes off the, the aliens uh, ship there. Um, so he had a big movie history background and uh, helped helped us create a, a movie poster, essentially, of uh, our Fate of Atlantis game. Amazing. Now, um, Hal Barwood is, you know, you work very closely with him. I think it was uh, you and Hal, basically, you know, I'm sure there's other people in the team, but you're the real sort of uh, heartbeat of Fate of Atlantis, one of my favourite games ever made. Um, I have to ask, actually, you, you created a story, uh, you, you know, you can fill in the gaps a bit here, but the whole brand new story it wasn't based on a movie, um, it, it was based on a kind of a myth, like the urban myth of Atlantis. Mm -hmm. How how about did that come about? Was it a brainstorming session? Did how something it is? You know, I'd love to. I have no idea how the sort of ideas came about. And, sure. Know. Well, it it evolved over a, a couple of months, I think. And um, originally, we were given a really a lot of freedom to do almost whatever we wanted. And and both George and Stephen, I should say, uh, throughout the work we did were always very um, uh, open to us doing whatever we liked. You know, even with um, The Last Crusade and having it be based on the movie, we had been given, you know, Georgia told us if we wanted to do something crazy with Indy or, you know, have it divert from the story to feel free. Um, but they handed us, uh, George gave us actually a script that uh, uh, Chris Columbus, the, the screenwriter, had done that they had looked at but rejected for the third movie. And you can find it online now. At the time, it was super secret, but it's uh, uh, based on uh, this Chinese myth of Sun Wukong, the stone monkey king. So if you look up Indiana Jones monkey king script, I think it's pretty easy to find online. And we just really didn't like the script. Uh, I, I recently reread it. And um, in particular, I'll, I'll have to say that there's a um, uh, kind of a comic character who's one of Indy's female students who follows him around throughout the full movie. And it's really pretty blatantly misogynistic that he's constantly, he sleeps with her, they make it clear that he basically has an affair with her, drops her, and then she follows him around for the rest of the movie and he keeps spurning her and ridiculing her. And it, it's, you know, at one point she spends uh, two weeks in a uh, barrel of bananas 
with nothing but bananas to eat to get, you know, and it just, and, and that's, that's really funny, you know, and then she comes out and she's, you know, been, I, you can only imagine what it would be like to, to, to wow. be stuck in that. At any rate, we just said, this is a terrible, um, uh, idea and, uh, we're looking for what to do next. And of course the, the names of, of the, um, movies and the, the, core of the movie is usually is about whatever it is that Indiana Jones is is going after the the MacGuffin in movie terms because usually it doesn't matter too much what it is that he's getting it's just that he has to have this uh, really interesting often mystical thing to 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 look for and so Hal and I went to the extensive library we had at Skywalker Ranch um, poked around with a bunch of different myths and uh, legends and that sort of thing and narrowed it down to uh, Excalibur and Atlantis. But what helped clinch it is that we found a book about Atlantis that showed a an illustration of Atlantis as a city of concentric rings. And it was so game-like that we said, you know, this is it, this is such a perfect idea. We need to make, the, make it about Atlantis and have it set inside this sort of concentric ring shape. It's a, it's a great game, I have to say. I replayed it again recently and um, it, it holds up. Um, I know you get asked this often, now, so that you don't have to go into too much depth, but the, sure. the, free, the free pathway system was, was quite original at the time for a point of adventure, which is usually quite a linear, uh, well, you know, you can argue, you know, it's a quite a linear story if, in that sort of settings from start to finish. But I, I love that that idea. It, I'd love to, was, was it your idea? Was it your brainchild? And, and how, how do you kind of reflect on it now? And do you have a personal favorite pathway? Yeah, of course. Well, it was, it was my idea. It actually grew out of our work on The Last Crusade again, and that uh, I, I had actually been pushing. I, I'm a strong believer in having games uh, adapt themselves to the style of the person playing them. And uh, I, Indiana Jones is such a multifaceted character that it, we wanted, for example, the action elements, you know, in our, in our adventure games, usually with point and click adventures, there's not a lot of reflex action or timing uh, issues. But with Indiana Jones, so much, you know, from the very first time you meet him where he's, uh, you know, snatching the idol and rolling under the, the door and getting his hat just as the at the nick of time as the, the you know, uh, door comes down, we felt that having some kind of action timing puzzles would be fun. And we didn't integrate them very well, I think, in Last Crusade. You know, we, we had some alternatives, but basically we didn't have the time or resources to do separate paths. But it was something that was in my mind because of that. And when it came to Fate of Atlantis, I really pushed for it. Hal was the project leader, so he actually built the, the bulk of the game but we designed it together and worked on the story together. And I have to give him huge credit for sticking with the multi-path idea because it made the game much more complicated than if there had been a single path, but it certainly paid off and, and we're all happy that it worked out that way. Uh, literally every review that came out mentioned the multiple paths as one of the things that was unique and positive about it. So it worked quite well that way. And certainly I would say the team's path uh, where you get to play the part of Sophia for part of the game yeah. uh, is, is my favorite. Uh, I thought that was the most interesting and in that it kind of gave you a different perspective and it, it was uh, about cooperation and, and dialogue as much as it was about uh, puzzle solving and certainly action. Um, so really that's, that's the evolution of it. And I just say, I, I was just reading this morning that they're in the works on a remake of Westwood Studios Blade Runner game that came out a few years later yeah. and Luke Castle who was the the lead on that um, based a lot of the Blade Runner structure on Fate of Atlantis and took it a few steps farther that if people get a chance to play the the remade Blade Runner game it has the same quality where you based on the choices you make in the game the story changes quite radically and as I said it's it's great to have a game that essentially reads your personality and adapts itself to fit the kind of gameplay that you prefer. I haven't played it myself, but I've heard very good things about the Blade Runner. Are you a fan of the game yourself then? Oh, it's it's great, yeah. I mean, just, uh, <laughs> I'm giving them a sales pitch there, but yeah, I, I think um, I, it, the, the core of the Blade Runner movies are the characters not knowing if they're uh, a replicant or a human being. And in the game, 
you can actually, uh, well, I, I shouldn't give anything away, but that's at the core of the multiple paths that they, they do. It's, big, it's a big honor, isn't it, to say that your idea uh, was used elsewhere in you know, other titles. Well, um, I mean, as I said with the, the Pirates thing, you know, oh, one of the things that I, I loved was that everyone was very collaborative and uh, I've never had a, a you know fellow game designer working for another company be upset about having some of their ideas be borrowed. And in fact, sometimes people would come to me and ask me how I did things specifically so they could integrate them into their games. And mm -hmm. I've always been flattered rather than offended about it. Because uh, there's so much room for creativity that just to be able to take some elements of someone else's game, I think it's it's really a, uh, a high compliment that you, you like it enough to do that. Good stuff. Before before we talk about the dig, which I really want to get into in a minute, um, was after the fate of Atlantis, you know, huge success. I, I assume it's one one of the best sellers at the time for Lucas Arts. Did you ever kind of all time bestseller for wow. for adventure games? Yeah, That's over incredible. a million units. There there were some. Uh, I, I'm not sure whether Grim Fandango, but which came out you know almost ten years later, I think might have done better. And there's some argument as to exactly what how you count the the sales numbers, but Certainly at its time, it was by far the biggest seller we ever had. That's amazing. I mean, you would, again, you, you might be offended, you would assume it would be a Monkey Island title, but no, you know, Bay of Atlantis, what, what, wow, setting records. Well, I have to say today, in terms of popularity, I would say the Monkey Island series, at least, is certainly more popular. And, and particularly in Europe, it's, we always sold better in Europe uh, than we did in the US, sometimes by a huge factor. And even within Europe, Germany was the epicenter of that. And when uh, any of us go to Germany, it's 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 just a weird sensation that um, just like uh, Jerry Lewis, you know, who is sort of seen as a, a kind of a mild, you know, funny comic in the U.S. was a huge god in France. Um, or David Hasselhoff, you know, is, mm -hmm. is huge in the German speaking regions. Our games, you know, the in Monkey Island in particular is just legendary in Germany, and it's amazing to me how how many Germans want to interview me about that. What, do you know, why do you think interest like Europe likes that sort of genre? Well, uh, there were a couple of reasons. Uh, uh, part of it was that we we had a marketing head who later became our our uh, president for a while, Doug Glenn, who really believed in the European market and. Uh, the biggest innovation he had starting quite early on um, was that instead of going to one big house like um, uh, U.S. Gold or some of the others that did a lot of distribution in Europe and having them do all of the translations, they, they basically would have teams of people who translated into, you know, eight or ten different languages. Um, he made individual deals with publishers in Spain and Germany and Italy and this sort of thing, and had them have their own local people who were native speakers of those languages do the translations. And often the other translations were a native English speaker who would learn French or German or whatever, and the quality wasn't as good from, from their viewpoints. Um, and Boris Schneider, who actually did our German translations, he's uh, went on to become a VP at Microsoft, and he actually came back to to work with Ron on the Thimbleweed Park uh, game recently. Um, he grew up in Germany and the U.S. going back and forth as a teenager and had a huge colloquial gra grasp of uh, not just the languages, but also the, the humor of the times and the idioms. And I think our translations, the same thing in, in Asia, we had Japanese and Korean translations that uh, I think were were much better than the the kind of um, you know translation mill ones that came out. I love it. That's, yeah, brilliant. Um, all right, let's talk about the dig because the dig um, is a game which I again I've completed very recently. It's one of my it's probably the last Lucas Arts game I've just played and completed. I thought it was very good, um, but you. You were the first, I think you said the production, yeah, the project leader of that game. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you're right, you said, uh, I think there's four project leaders in total. I mean, that that's unbelievable, which the the dig went through, I think, is it fair to say production hell? Is that fair? Is that a bit harsh? Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. From our first meeting, uh, actually, the, the meeting where it was announced that I'd lead the project happened during the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, the, the last biggest earthquake in the Bay Area um, that uh, uh, knocked down a, a part of a bridge and, you know, was on, on 
international news at the time. And that should have been a, a sign important. Uh, we were actually having a meeting and um, it was announced that I'd work on the game. And I think maybe half an hour later, suddenly we were all diving under the table because the entire room was shaking. Um, it took six years from that first meeting to when the game came out, which was extraordinary. It was certainly a record for LucasArts. Uh, there have been games like, I think, Duke Nukem Forever that have taken longer, and Blizzard's had some that have gone on. Uh, Star StarCraft II took forever to come out. But at the time, it was a record setter, I think, and, and absolutely for our company. And largely, I think, because uh, Stephen was pretty heavily involved. Uh, George and Stephen, as I said, were in at the first meetings, and then Steven Spielberg stayed involved throughout the process because it was his original concept. And people loved getting close to him. Uh, I, I just recently uh, ran across an email thread I had saved and printed out of my first few weeks on the project that uh, give a sense of what was going on, where I was basically complaining to my boss that uh, I had tried to set up the next meeting where both um, Steven Spielberg and George Lucas would show up and my boss wanted to be there and the head of marketing wanted to be there. And there were like three or four people above me in the chain that all said, oh, I want to be in on this meeting. And they were never in on any of the early creative meetings for our other games, but they wanted to be in the room with these guys and be able to, you know, throw out their ideas too. But just talking to Stephen and George's um, minders who set up their schedules, I was already like three weeks out to find a slot where the two of them could work together. And Stephen was in LA, George was up in Northern California with us, so he had to fly up to do it. So I set something up and it wasn't good with, I think my boss or one of the other people. And it was one of those things where once I had it all set, then a week before the meeting, turned out that Stephen had some other commitment and could we change it to two days later? I was like, oh my God, it was just... And so I basically said, look, if I'm gonna have to do it this way, we're never going to even have our first meeting, much less get the game done. So they gave me, you know, dispensation to be flexible with it at least. But ultimately, not just for me, but I, I've I've been friends with uh, several people, uh, people like um, Robin Hunnicky uh, or um, uh, Clint Hawking, that have subsequently worked on Star Wars games uh, or worked with Spielberg. And I warned them about this, and they've had identical experiences that when you get people that high up in the movie industry, everyone in the company wants to be in on the meetings and it just becomes you know, really hard to, to kind of keep control and keep something moving along. So that was unfortunately uh, a lot of what happened to us. Uh, could I still ask that, what were your early ideas and how far did it did go before you sort of left the project? Was there Yeah, well, we yeah. went reasonably far along. I had a very radical idea of trying to combine a role-playing game with our adventure game uh, uh, structure. And um, Steven's original idea uh, was really exciting, but we, uh, the technology at the time just didn't allow us to do it. Uh, his basic concept involved two competing teams of archeological digs on a planet, an alien planet, uh, finding you know old technology. And uh, the element that he wanted to do that I thought was really brilliant was borrowing, he, he, he pitched it to us as um, Forbidden Planet meets Treasure of the Sierra Madre because uh, it's a cliche, but like so many movie people, when he would come to us with an idea, it would be one movie meets another. And that particular combination of these two old movies uh, was actually a brilliant insight in that Forbidden Planet involves finding an alien planet with this super powerful technology, but the people that made it died off, you know, centuries ago. And Treasure of Sierra Madre was a Humphrey Bogart movie where they're digging for gold, but gradually everybody starts to mistrust everyone else as taking the gold for themselves and fights break out and it all falls apart. And he said, what if you did that and brought them together and had to have two teams of archeologists on this alien planet and gradually they start to mistrust each other. And you're not sure if it's the alien technology or maybe the aliens themselves that are somehow influencing them. And that was the core idea. It was very simple and really intriguing. Uh, but we couldn't do entire teams of characters. And, uh, you know, we did the best we could. Uh, I had two individuals competing with each other. Um, Brian Moriarty, who was uh, the, the second 
project leader and formed most of the ideas that you see in the final game. He, you know, added extra characters and had them work against each other at, at one point or another. Um, but it was a very different game that I proposed. And I think I have to say, looking back at my early designs, we, we got several months into it. We had some puzzles wired up. We had a lot of artwork uh, done. And I like a lot of the elements that I had, but I think it was the correct decision not to go ahead with the game because in some ways it was a little bit too strange, too ambitious. If, if I knew now, knew then what I know now about how difficult it was to um, you know, push stuff through with, with George and Steven involved, I think I would have taken a simpler, uh, more direct approach. But of course, that's how you learn is, is making those mistakes. And, um, and I was actually taken off the project so that I could be the producer on, was our first producer on Day of the Tentacle that was just coming out because they were looking for some help on that. And that was a wonderful game, yeah. so I was I was content enough about that. But uh, uh, it, I I do wish that some elements of my dig game. There were some puzzles that I loved. The alien creatures were designed by this fantastic artist, and I, I wish we had had the chance to make that uh, you know see the light of day. Oh, good on. I mean, I, I, you're, you hinted that you are a fan of the finished game itself, and that you played obviously you've played the dig since I take it the finished game. Yeah, I, I have mixed feelings about it. I think that the, I'm, I'm a stickler for puzzle design and I think that the puzzles could have been uh, better at times, but I think that the story was great. Uh, I mentioned Orson Scott Card before and he was brought in to do a lot of the writing and having a professional writer of his caliber, I think really made a big difference. Uh, I've mentioned that Brian Moriarty, uh, I think Brian is really heavily undercredited on that game because the characters, the storyline, a lot of the basics were his idea. But then after him, Dave Grossman came in for a while. I think he was only project leader for two or three months. And Sean Clark finished it up. But because Sean was the last person in, um, he was basically given most of the, the credit for, and he certainly deserves it for bringing it over the finish line. But uh, a lot of the concepts in there, I think, were Brian's. And I think he's He's got a very minor credit in the thing. Um, so, so did I, but I, I didn't deserve much because a lot of my influence was not seen in the final game. Fair enough. I like the, no, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I, I know it's not my set of questions, but really quickly, Day of the Tentacle, another amazing game. Um, oh, yeah, it was there, a fun one. It was, and I think there's, there's been a remake or sort of unofficial sequel. Have you heard about that by a, a team? Oh, there, there have been unofficial sequels to many of our games. There are, There's a Fate of Atlantis one that's been in the works for... I think 10 years or so, but yeah, the, um, there have been at least, uh, I think two, um, with, with day of the tentacle that people have tried to do. And one was Zach McCracken. I mean, people, the fans are all trying to, to make their own versions of, of sequels, but yeah, day of the tentacle was great. I, I have to say the brainstorming sessions for that were probably among the most entertaining creative sessions I've ever been at that Ron, Dave, and Tim, brainstorming about comedy games, being in the room with them, you know, I, I'm sure it's like being in the writer's room at 30 Rock or some of the other big TV comedies, uh, Saturday Night Live, because it had that sense. And so many ideas were thrown out, just that got us all laughing, some of which were uh, sometimes a little obscene or, or just too radical, but it just, you know, made us, uh, uh, you know, joke all the more about how it could work out. And even though I was only working on that project for a short while, it was, it was very memorable and a lot of fun. Oh, fair enough. Wh which game did you have the most fun working on? Was it Day of the Tentacle then, or was it? Or No, I mean, Day of the Tentacle, as I said, it was very short, and I actually uh, ended up um, uh, leaving the, the company and the project uh, or the, the fairly early on. But, um, you know, I would say out of all the games that I worked on there, Secret Weapons of the Luftwaffe uh, was probably most enjoyable for me, partly because I had a relatively small role, but worked so closely creatively with Larry Holland, who was the main person behind that, that we really were in total sync on how the game worked. And I love um, the combination of strategy and uh, air combat. Uh, it's It was a, quite a successful game, but it gets very little 
interest these days. You know, flight simulators kind of fell out of favor, and mm-hmm. Microsoft has 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 brought it back a bit. But they're one of those genres that was really hot in the '80s and early '90s, and and then gradually fell out of favor. Um, Fate of Atlantis is probably what I'm proudest of having worked on, um, just because uh, I think. You know, as as you've said, and a lot of other people have said, it's it's been one of their favorites. And uh, in particular, I think the thing about it that I I'm happiest to hear is the number of people that have said that they felt it should have been made into a movie, yes. which was was never really in the works. But we tried to make it feel like worthy of a, a movie script, and certainly among the game fans, uh, we managed to hit that mark pretty well. And I'm I'm very pleased to hear that. Yeah, I might agree with that. Um, in sort of off off air and sort of email communications, now you, mm-hmm. you mentioned that you've had a chance to go through some old files and uh, dig up some old sort of records of yours. And I'd love to ask you, what is there any games you started work on but you never managed to finish or release at LucasArts or at Freedio or any other companies that you thought really could have been quite successful, or most interesting? Well, sure. I think any game designer has a lot of that, and. I went through my my LucasArts files recently, as is, is what I was told you, and I had um, I counted uh, was it 1,500 pages of documents, and this was all of us, not just me, of course, yeah. but all the the team over the eight years that I was there, and an additional 230 pages of, of illustrations, um, and some of those were games we made. Uh, some of them were multiple versions of games. I remember I actually I've got uh, Loom, for example. I've got three or four different revisions that uh, uh, of the the script for that one, um, uh, the game design too. And uh, but as to what you say, there are many games that a lot of us came up with that that were proposed and never went beyond the proposal stage. Or in some cases, we had some early prototypes. And there are a few that I would still like to do. Uh, there's one I had, a concept I developed, and I, I again, Orson Scott Card was working with us, and I talked to him about it, uh, called the Star Cage. And the idea of that is there. it, it, it also was, was similar to a, a game Hal had done, but that we'd come up with this independently, where a lot of, a lot of science fiction stories have talked about aliens collecting humans for... Um, essentially a zoo you know that you're you're one of several alien races that they think will be cool for their their new zoo and in this case uh, the concept was this huge ship that had a bunch of different domes each, each one of which had a different alien race that had been collected by the guys who own the ship and humans you're one of the humans that gets collected and stuck in a little human dome and you have to basically stage a revolt and team up meet with and team up with the other captive races to overthrow the guys who have uh, kidnapped you and take you back to Earth. And I still think for an adventure game, it would have been a really fun thing. You, you get to meet a lot of different aliens. Uh, there's room for both humor and drama. The uh, ship setting was was great for those days because it gave you a constricted area so that you didn't have to have... One of the problems we had with our games is that we could only afford to do a very limited number of of settings, essentially. Uh, And so for Indiana Jones, we had to pick and choose very carefully. If we were in Iceland, for example, we had one or two background images, and that was the entire country. Uh, And uh, having an alien ship means that we could not only restrict it, but each dome could have certain similarities because they were all built by the same character characters Mm -hmm. and could reuse the artwork and just dress it up a little differently. So at any rate, that was probably one of my favorites, but I've got half a dozen other um, proposals out there, uh, mostly science fictional, that I think would have been fun to make as games. Oh, well, that does, that does sound honestly really interesting. You, you never say never, no. Do you reckon there's still a chance that could come out? Hey, you never know. I, never. I get to recycle a lot of ideas that, uh, you know, certainly fragments of ideas and uh, puzzles or concepts that I've I've worked into other games that uh, I, I came out with later on. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, after Lucas Arts, um, correct me if I'm wrong. You worked at the Three Do Company, is that right? That's right. With um, Trip Hawkins, who I've spoken to in the past. We've had him on the podcast. Um, I can't, don't mean to <laughs> promote ourselves too much, but he what what an amazing man. What an interesting entrepreneur. He was very humble on, on the podcast. Actually, he 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 spoke how he had a lot of highs and a, a, some quite big lows. 
But the Freedio company, uh, the Freedio itself, the console is absolutely astonishing, almost ahead of its time. But what, how exactly did you get a chance to work with Trip and the Freedio, and what what was your exact role? If you don't mind me asking. So I knew Trip because some of the early games that I'd done at LucasArts were actually published by EA, uh, specifically the uh, PHM Pegasus and Strike Fleet, and I uh, so I worked with the EA uh, producer community. Uh, in fact, um, one of my first producers. Um, you know, on on uh, the project there was a guy named Rich Hilleman who had started fixing disk drives and went up to the point of being a vice president at EA and moved on to Amazon and is now retired at this point. But he he was uh, one of their earliest employees. Um, and I, you know, got to, you know, it was a small company. I got to meet Trip and all the other, you know, luminaries they had at EA. Um, but a close friend of mine, RJ Michael, I had hired him uh, into the games industry when I worked at Williams and he worked on Sinistar with me and we stayed friends. We moved out to California at almost the same time. He came out to work on Amiga and the Amiga computer uh, at the same time I came out to LucasArts. And so we, we uh, you know, stayed in the Bay Area. We actually, he introduced me to the woman I'm married to now and oh. I met her at a party at his house. Um, so we had strong connections there. The technology behind the 3D machine came from RJ and his his co uh, collaborator Dave Needle, and so through RJ, when he heard that I had been laid off at, at LucasArts, they they had uh, a big round of layoffs there. Um, he said, "Well, I can't tell you what what this is, but there's this new thing, and I want want you to interview for it." And without having any idea of what it was, I just came out, and I knew that. Uh, he told me that the trip was involved, and I came to meet with Trip, um, and he brought me in as employee number nine at what was then called SMSG, which stood for San Mateo Software Group, because they didn't want to give away anything about what they were working on. So that was how I got into it. And you know, RJ worked on the hardware. I ended up working, you know, on the software. And uh, you know, we we in fact I remember came up with the name 3DO. Um, you know, well into it, you know, probably six months into the time I was there before we even knew what it was going to be called. Brilliant. And do you, yeah, that's great, actually. And it, why do you think the free year never really, really sort of became a huge success? Oh, it was, it was very simple. A uh, trip was trying a very daring and a very, a very ambitious business strategy uh, up until that point. And in fact, subsequently, um, the game consoles have been made by a big company, uh, you know, these days it's Sony and Microsoft, and then we had Nintendo and Sega, you know, among them. And they sell the hardware at a loss and make up for it because they also own the rights to all the software and they get a lot of money for each bit of software. But Trip was looking at the um, VHS tape industry and how a VHS tape recorder, they, they invented the VHS format and it was fighting with Betamax for a while. But it wasn't a VHS company, and it wasn't just, say, Samsung or Panasonic that made it. They licensed out the technology to make the hardware, uh, and they made money from that. And each of the hardware companies could basically make their own variant of a machine and, and all their bells and whistles as long as it was compatible so that you could play the same games on all the systems. And he thought that that would free up the games industry from the tyranny of having one company in charge of everything and having taking their cut of every piece of software, which as head of EA, he thought was an undue burden. And it's great. In fact, we're seeing that fight take out right now between Epic and Apple. It's, it's interesting that everybody wants to, to break free of having a platform be in, in the hands of one company that gets to get their cut of every bit of software that comes out. But as it turns out, if you can't sell the, soft, the hardware at a loss and make up for it with software, then the cost of the hardware is really high. So the 3DO, when it came out, was uh, $700 US, yeah. Yeah. which corrected for inflation out of all of the, I don't know, 80 or so game consoles that ever been released. It was the second most expensive. The Neo Geo, I think, was number one. Um, yeah. But even today, I mean... It, dollars that sounds like quite a bit that was in you know 1994 dollars so it would be like the equivalent of selling a game console probably for a couple thousand dollars now Crazy. and it was it was a great system but the other thing that happened is that sony 
was thinking, hey, this is not a bad idea, but we're going to use the old model. And they came out with the first PlayStation about a year after the 3DO, and it basic and it cost two or three hundred dollars less, and that was it. You know that that pretty much put for the first year actually 3DO did extremely well, and it was before the whole dot com boom, and it was great to see the stock go out on the market when the company went public, and in the first day it went up like fifty percent, and we were all thinking we're all going to be rich, and sadly you know when the PlayStation came out the whole thing crashed. It's a, the three D we we could talk about for hours. It's such an interesting story, but I don't, I don't want to you know take all your time and say no. I really appreciate it. Um, really quickly before we go on to some quick fire questions from from social media, you you've worked again recently with Hal Barwood, haven't you? On is it the four hundred project? Do you mind quickly explaining that? Sure. Well, I should say most recently we worked on a, a German game called uh, Matahari, uh, okay. and even that was seven or eight years ago. The four hundred project. Um, was Hal's idea. Uh, he gave a talk at the Game Developers Conference in probably about 1998 um, called Four of the 400. And his point was that having gone to film school, they taught all these rules of thumb, these little basic things that this is how you do this in a movie. Uh, one example he gave me is that if you have two characters talking and the camera is following them along, where you position the camera depends on the emotional tone that you want to present. So if you want the, the audience to feel really involved and intimate with the, the conversation, you put the camera in front of them and have them walking towards the camera, talking to each other, facing you. If you want to feel like an eavesdropper, you have them moving across uh, in a, a side shot with the camera. I mean, it's a little things that, uh, you know, when he mentioned some of these, it's like, oh, of course, I never noticed that, but all movies do it that way. Uh, in fact, if you're really interested in this, look up something called um, the, uh, uh, oh, what's it called? The something line, the, um, damn, I'm forgetting. All right. There, oh, there's some <laughs> wonderful, wonderful versions of this sort of thing. Um, uh, the stage line. Okay, uh, yeah. in, movies. Anyway, uh, he said, there must be these things for games. Games have been around long enough that we should start, you know, publishing them. And so he came up with, he said arbitrarily, you know, there's probably hundreds of these. And he had four of them. So he called it four of the 400. And I came to him after that. I said, well, this is really fascinating. Would you mind if I, you know, started to go out and try and collect more of these rules? And we basically formed what was called the 400 Project to go out and ask a bunch of other game designers for their favorite rules. And we collected over 100 of them. And then it kind of fizzled out because it was a major project and neither of us had time for it. But recently I've been reviving some of that and uh, collecting some new rules, uh, gleaning some of my own from books and kind of writing them in a format. And I'm very excited about where it's going. I'm hoping to have a book that will come out, but I've been planning to do this literally for decades now, so I don't want to have anybody hold their breath. Uh, Hal has basically turned it over to me at this point. I asked him if he wanted to be involved. He's happy with his current career, which is he's, he's on his third career now as a novelist after having done movies and games. And uh, at the very least, I can promise that there will be a number of essays and articles about what I found about these rules. And what's really interesting to me is that when I started to look at all these haphazard rules that we got from you know, a couple dozen different people, uh, patterns started to emerge. And it's the patterns of how rules group together that I think is the most exciting thing. And that's, you know, I'll leave it at that for now because that's, that's at the heart of what I want to write about. Could you share one rule with us, or is it all still tight lips? Oh, no, no, no. The rules are actually out there. Uh, Hal has a, a, the best version on his website, I think. Um, if you search Google the 400 project, that's the first mm -hmm. thing that comes up. Um, well, one of the one of my favorite ones that I think is is a fairly obvious but a, a solid one is to have uh, uh, clear short term goals. Um, so always give the player something to do in the next you know minute or two that's very obvious for them, something so that they're not stuck thinking, I, I don't know where to go, I don't know what to do. Well, I can at least collect you know, some more of these gems and forge whatever, or I can go out and you know, uh, uh, fight these, these giant rats or you know, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, I, another um, 
Another one that I, I think is is an interesting interesting one. I was just working on a the chapter about this is um, uh, it says emphasize um, exploration and discovery, and it talks about how you know then when you think about it deeper, there's a, a human desire to find new things and to always be discovering some new things, and if you look at that deeper, you realize that almost every game. The, re the point at which you stop playing is when it feels like there's nothing new to discover, nothing new to uncover, whether it's new areas in the game or new features, new skill sets, new objects. Uh, when you think you've kind of run out of all of those things, that's when you tend to lose interest and move on. So emphasizing exploration and discovery in its larger sense, you know, it's a good basic rule. Really interesting. No, I've never really thought about that, but thank you. And I, um, right, sure. before we get through to those quick, quick, quick fire questions, um, what projects, and these two in the games industry now, you, what, what projects are you involved in right oh, now? Oh, very much so. Well, I'm working with half a dozen different companies now as a freelancer, which is really what I prefer to do these days for, for quite a few years, except for a chunk of time I spent at Google, I've been freelancing. Uh, most of my clients are in the overlap of games and health, and uh, they're doing everything from making games to train physicians. Uh, to actually get continuing medical education credits from playing games. Um, one of my favorite clients is Achille that just this summer got uh, the first ever FDA clearance for a video game to treat a disease directly. Uh, in other words, you play the game and it helps. In this case, ADHD, uh, you play it over the course of uh, treatment. Uh, doctors can now prescribe a video, this specific video game, to treat uh, ADHD in, in teenagers, um, and they're, they're starting to do that. Another client is doing uh, pain remediation through a game so that instead of using drugs and opioids, there's a game and a little electronic gadget associated with it that teaches you how to control your own perception of pain, a whole range of those things. And one non-medical project uh, company called Adventure Lab that's doing hosted VR escape rooms that I think is just brilliant. It, it's the kind of escape rooms we've been doing in person before the coronavirus, but you can you know, online either through VR or through a, a browser um, team up with other friends of yours and enter into this game universe that not only is a, a set of puzzles, but there's a host in there who plays the part of different characters and uh, this was started by a couple of ex-Pixar people. So it's a, it's a wonderful story-oriented uh, game project that's in its early stages. That's absolutely incredible. Um, you've got a website now, isn't it? Is, is, where's the best place to find out this out? Is it your website, for example? Well, I would say actually uh, LinkedIn these days is where I kind of keep mm. things best up to date as term, terms of who I'm working with and, and uh, easy enough to follow the links there. And I'm the only Noah Falstein in the world. I've got one of those names that so far, at least nobody else has uh, the same one, so it's very easy to find. Brilliant. Um, oh, brilliant. That's such, such an interesting story. I you know, love, love hearing about your career. Right. I did send out a few tweets and Facebook um, you know, group questions about you and your career and we've got some real quick fire questions is that right no you don't spend too long on these no. Let's do it. yeah um so first question is where did the iq points come from uh I, that that links to the first in that james game i believe yeah actually i saw that question on on twitter i guess and they mentioned that there was a a previous indiana jones game that had a similar yeah. system and yeah, i actually had seen that game because uh I, I, as you say, quick fire, I won't get into the full details, but it, as part of our licensing group, they would send the games that were being made by other companies to us to review. Um, and that one has Indiana Jones using a cane instead of a whip because they, they wanted to make an Indiana Jones game. They didn't think they could get the license. They knew if they used a whip, then they would get inf you know, infringement problems. And then they actually got the license after they were done and it was too late to go back and change the cane to be a whip. And I just thought, I mean, that's actually kind of prophetic given Harrison Ford's age now, maybe he'll, he'll use a cane for the, the new movie. Um, but at any rate, no, it was that game wasn't the inspiration. It was more um, some other, gosh, what was it? There was another, uh, not an adventure game, but I think an educational game that had you tick off what you had accomplished. And what we did that was different, I think, than any other game was 
as I mentioned, the Last Crusade didn't have different paths, but it had alternate solutions to puzzles. Mm -hmm. And we wanted people who were the real completists that like to do everything to know whether they had done every single puzzle in the game, even if they had to restart the game and do totally different things. And the IQ points, uh, called Indie Quotient, were our way of doing that. And it worked so well in appeasing those completists that uh, we also incorporated it into Fate of Atlantis. Brilliant. Um, I don't know if you know this, um, actually, no, but the, do you know where the art for Fate of Atlantis and the Dig, uh, was it background pictures painted and then scanned onto a computer, or was it done straight from the PC or Mac? Is the question we had. Uh, that was, and it's, it's again, the failing memory things. I think primarily that was done uh, using electronic paint programs. I think it wasn't until a little bit later with um, perhaps Day of the Tentacle, it was being produced about the same time. Uh, uh, boy, I don't even remember. No, it might've even been one of the later ones. Um, but uh, it, it took us a while to be able to get to the point of scanning stuff in and also computers having enough color resolution that it looked good enough. Um, we were experimenting with it at that time, so I don't. that's why I don't recall exactly. But most of our art was still being done using, uh, I think, Deluxe Paint, which came from Electronic mm. Arts uh, at the time. Of course, yeah, yeah. Um, who, out of all the people working at LucasArts and LucasFilms, came up with most of the puzzles and how much brainstorming was done before they were passed over to the program is to actually be done? So. Well, I, you know, as I've said, actually, a lot of times the programmers and the designers, you know, were the same people. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's no one person, um, the project leaders that I've mentioned, we would all brainstorm a lot together. Um, out of everybody at the company, um, Ron Gilbert and David Fox were the two that I worked with more than any of the others. But I shared an office with Brian Moriarty when he was working on Loom, and we, we talked a lot. In fact, Loom was in some ways based on one of my other uh, game ideas that never got, got made uh, very loosely. It was, it was all Brian's thing, but the initial concept was something that, that was sparked by, by one of mine. And uh, Chip Morningstar, who is not as well known, but he helped us create the SCUM system that does all of the uh, uh, underlying uh, programming behind our adventure games for many years. And he also worked on something called Habitat that was the very first multiplayer graphic MMO um, that we launched, you know, and only wow. you know, very limited release. At any rate, uh, I collaborated with, you know, we all collaborated with each other. Many of us, as I've said, have stayed very close friends and worked together on many other projects since then. Um, and the ideas for the puzzles we would look over, literally look over each other's shoulders and say, well, this is a little bit counterintuitive and couldn't we move this over here? And wouldn't it be great if we did a special animation? And can we afford to do a special animation? Can we reuse one of the other animations for a different puzzle so that it looks good here, but we don't have to use the uh, space for on the disc to, to store it? All that kind of stuff was going back and forth. And often the technical issues and the budget issues were equally important as to the puzzling which is kind of true today, but you, you don't have to cram stuff into these machines that fit, you know, just a, a literally, you know, such a small number of bytes of data. So it's a lot easier now to, to add stuff in these days. Ah, fair, fair days. Um, was there any puzzles that you maybe came up with or ideas that you wanted to put into any of your games at LucasArts that you just didn't, maybe it's too complicated or not, not enough time? Or... Yeah, actually, I alluded to this with the dig. We had a puzzle, they're set in a, a city this ancient abandoned alien city high up in the mountains where there was volcanic activity. And much like Iceland, as a matter of fact, you had um, snow covered volcanoes that had occasional eruptions that would melt the snow and lava. And there was a, a puzzle, a rather complex puzzle that I was very proud of that involved um, a pool. You have to fill a pool with water or fill a, a cavern with water and then dam it up and stop the hot water from flowing in and let it cool off and it freezes. And now you can walk across it. Uh -huh. But then you actually had to restart the hot water and melt it again and drain the water. I mean, it was many different steps, but each step I thought was very logical. And it was only based on the intuition you have about, you know, hot water will melt ice, regular water will freeze in freezing temperatures. 
blocking something will keep it from draining. All of this was just very common sense stuff, but yeah. you had to discover all the different pieces. And it, you know, I, I still think it was, it, it would have been a great adventure game puzzle that, uh, you know, maybe could be fit into some other game at some point. But of course, uh, uh, adventure games are, are certainly not in the mainstream like they used to be. No, sadly not. Um, you kind of answered this question a bit earlier, but do you, was there even the slightest rumblings after the success of Fate of Atlantis that, that it possibly could be made into the fourth Indiana Jones film? I know we've got the fourth now, but... Uh, oh, only only uh, in in the minds of fans. It was, it was really amusing for us to see, as games were released, the uh, speculation uh, online. It was... It was after the internet, but before the World Wide Web. So we would, yeah. you know, get a lot of this from magazines and some of it would show up in the online discussion groups that were out there. And there were all sorts of crazy ideas and people saying, oh, I have heard that Steven Spielberg is is in the works on a script on it. And we knew there was nothing of the kind. Um, but as I said, you know, we were flattered that people thought it was close enough to that, that they made that mistake. And a lot of it came from Hal's experience. He, he wrote, I think, uh, six or eight, you know, co-wrote six or eight screenplays that were made into movies. Uh, you know, he was very good at writing, you know, dialogue and scenes that felt like real movies because that's that's professionally what he did. And I think it fooled a lot of people into thinking that that's where we were. Oh, yeah, I'd still love to see it. <laughs> Personally, I think it would make a great film. Um, this is a you don't have to ask this question. We don't really want to know. But if it, was there anything you would change to your work if you go back in time? Any of the games you think? Well, actually, I'm not yeah, happy about well, that. Or... The simple answer is huge amounts of stuff. I think oh, right. any creative person looking back at their old stuff sees. I mean, I've, I've learned so much since then. You know, 30 years ago, some of the games I worked on, Coronas Rift, the first one I did a Lucas film. A lot of stuff about that I'm proud of. A lot of things I'm horrified that you know. That could have been uh, one of the first first-person shooters of its time, you know, years before Doom, if we had just changed a few elements and instead we focused on stuff that I thought was a lot of fun, but in retrospect was a terrible decision. So a lot of those things, you know, but I think most writers, most, you know, uh, uh, creative people, as soon as they put something out in the world, they're thinking of ways they wish they could have changed it. So, oh, Fair enough. Um... How would you see another Indiana Jones film? Would you, <laughs> in 2021, would you would you cast Harrison Ford? And I, I maybe not allowed to say this, but what would you see? Or do you think that franchise is, is, is well, gone? Well, one thing I learned from, from Spielberg, he was so gracious about, you know, people would ask him about what to do in the game and say, hey, I'm a movie guy, you know, let the game experts do that. And I would say to that, you know, let the movie experts <laughs> figure that part out. Yeah. Making movies, particularly when I was at DreamWorks in LA, I learned how hard it is and a lot of stuff that looks um, effortless and, and is, is almost always blood, sweat and tears to make it come out that way. So I'm going to leave it to the professionals in the movie side to, to answer that one. Fair enough. Okay, well, well <laughs> another question kind of basing this in. Sorry, no, is, have you ever seen Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull and do you like the film? <laughs> you <laughs> spoke about the original Indiana Jones, to be fair. <laughs> sure, I guess it, it won't hurt anybody's feelings who worked on it to say that I'm one of the many who, you know, certainly if I was ranking those movies, that would be the last on the list, that uh, there were a couple of things about it that I was kind of shocked were, were uh, you know, just didn't feel like Indiana Jones to me. There's some great elements. I've said, bring Marion Ravenwood back. I thought it was wonderful. But uh, yeah, a lot of stuff that just didn't quite make it. Yeah, yeah, good answer. Um, if you if you can make a game today and money or intellectual property with no obstacle, what type of game would you make? I mean, would you would you bring back Indiana you know, Jones again in that sort of event? Uh, you know, that's an interesting thing. That touches on, I think, a popular misconception uh, that what everybody really wants to do is have unlimited money, unlimited, you know, time and do whatever they want. And all of the best creative work I've done has been when I've been constrained, sometimes tightly constrained. Uh, the Last Crusade game, we were under the gun to try and have it come out when the movie came out. And it would have, if we had hit that, it would have broken all records. And as it was, it, it only took about nine months from start to finish to get that game out the door, which was probably the shortest of every one of our adventure games. Um, 
And because of the pressure, I think a lot of the parts of that game that I really like were were formed because we just had to um, be as resourceful as we could to figure out how to make it work. So the reality is, I, it's daunting for me to to be given unlimited. I I have a few sort of pet ideas, pet projects, but if it was a really unlimited budget, then I'd just be second guessing myself of, well, what if I made it even bigger? And well, yeah. could I even finish it if I made it bigger? And would it really be any better if it was bigger that way? Or how could I better invest the money? And, you know, it, it becomes, you know, the lessons I had about bringing in people like, you know, George and Steven to a project and how it actually made the game take that mm -hmm. much longer would make me worry about bringing in the very best people to work on a, an unlimited budget uh, title. And I'm sure that's, even the people that they don't have unlimited budget, but games now cost as much as $100 million, which certainly feels that way compared to what I was working with 30 years ago. And yet I'm sure they're they're very constrained by what they have to do. Yeah, no, fair enough. Um, <coughs> do you feel that it says here's an idea that games have lost a lot of story with the advanced technology um, and maybe the older games had better narrative than the games today uh, and possibly a bit more difficult as well? Do you think... Do you think that's true? Do you think modern? Are you a modern game fan yourself, or do you think it's lost something recently? I'm I'm a fan of a lot of the stuff that's being done, particularly the indie experimental games are, are pretty fascinating. Um, <clears throat> I you know I think storytelling in games is as strong now as it's ever been. Um, maybe I, I certainly agree that games were harder then, and it was it was actually dictated by the players who would say they wanted 20 to 40 hours of gameplay for their uh, you know, single purchase of a game. We experimented, Loom was a very distinct experiment to make a simpler, more accessible game that today might even be considered uh, a casual game. And if it were released you know, just a few years ago, <clears throat> excuse me, I think Loom could have been a huge hit. Uh, we had people who absolutely loved it because they could finish it in three or four hours. Yeah. But many, many more people who hated it for exactly the same reason and said, we actually got literal hate mail saying, you know, you are the worst people in the world. You know, they're actually more fervent than that. Um, you know, I, I spent $40 on this game and finished it in five hours. You know, you suck. And wow. uh, it was just, it was really sad because we had other people, a grandmother in Las Vegas, I remember, who wrote in and said, this was delightful. I've never played these video games before, but it was such a, it was much less challenging than I expected, and I enjoyed the whole experience. That was what we were aiming at, but there weren't that many grandmothers playing games wow. in, you know, 1989. Um, so games have definitely gotten easier, and I think it's a good thing. You know, even the hard games have easy modes now and people like to be able to finish a, a game in certainly four or five hours of, if not uh, faster. Uh, but storytelling, I think maybe what was different is that in those days, the technology was so limited that we felt, you know, that we had to put sometimes more effort and energy into the stories. Yeah. And certainly Lucasfilm, we felt a burden to be good storytellers because we had all come into the company wanting to do that. And um, Sierra Games, that was our biggest rival, particularly in the US, we often felt they had some games that had great stories, but a lot that felt like recycled Disney movies or uh, you know, just uh, we, we felt that we, we were raising the bar there. And I think some of our success in Europe over Sierra was due to having deeper stories, whereas uh, some of their success in the U.S. I think was was uh, based on having uh, better marketing and a better customer uh, uh, rapport that they they built up early on. Oh, great, very interesting answer. Um, I really like this question actually, and I'd love to get your point of view. And I think you even said this is a question that really got you thinking. Though, um, are there any plans? But, you know, or just some ideas of taking indie or any other sort of character, maybe Guybrush Fleetwood, uh, from the point of click adventure to virtual reality, so VR. It would allow the player to actually become the actual hero, so Guybrush or indie himself or, or, or herself. I mean, what do you think of that? How crazy would that be? Um, well, I, as I've mentioned, I've been working with a VR, you know, company, and it has really opened my eyes to the potential for VR. Uh, what's interesting, though, is that my first instinct would not necessarily let you to be to let you play that main character, or at least not all the time. You know, much like with with the team's path and Fate of Atlantis, sometimes I think it's interesting to be 
Indies, you know, co, you know, collaborator or, or, um, uh, even adversary. Uh, I mean, it would be, um, there are a lot of different ways that you could play that, but what I've learned about virtual reality and what I've also learned from my work on the medical side of things is that I, I believe VR affects your brain uh, in a much deeper way than almost any other, uh, in, in fact, not almost, but any other medium we have been able to come up with in terms of tricking your brain into thinking you're actually in the situation that is depicted in VR. And as the quality of the VR headsets goes up, that's only getting better. It's part of the, the secret of why games are able, VR games are able to, uh, you know, work with uh, people's emotions. There are a lot of VR treatments for post-traumatic stress dis disorder, for example, because VR is, is incredibly good at, at evoking deep emotional responses, particularly to get a little technical with the amygdala that's buried deep in your brain that is the focus of anger, of fear, of arousal in the sense of, uh, you know, being excited or happy about things. It's, it's one of the deepest parts of our brain that's present in lizards and other animals. And I think we will see in the future that VR is activating that more strongly than any kind of movies or books have been able to. And for those reasons, I think VR is both a powerful tool and something we're going to have to be careful with using, but I'd love to do some of these games in VR uh, with a big budget that would allow us, I, th I think to some extent we've already seen it with um, uh, the the uh, Vader um, game on, on that ILM XLab did, uh, Vader Immortal, uh, that's a VR game that lets you play Darth Vader. And, you know, mm. as in that case, playing the bad guy or in his case, you know, somebody who's both a, a bad guy and a good guy, uh, that can be more interesting than just playing the hero, I think. Um, so, you know, we'll see. I mean, it might be really interesting to play an Indiana Jones game where uh, you are all of the dangers that Indiana go goes through. There's one point where you're a boulder that tries to roll over him, and you're another one where you're a snake that's going after him. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll see. I'm sure that we people would also want to be Indiana Jones and the VR controller. And we we had uh, some actual bull whips that had been used, same ones that had been used in the movie. And we would learn how to to whip with those as a kind of a pastime wow. at Skywalker Ranch. It's really hard to use a whip well, and mm. the VR controllers would be excellent for. Uh, trying to get exactly the right motion down and, and simulating the mechanics of a whip perfectly. That'd be incredible. That's what a great answer. And um, I, I, learned some, I learned some stuff then though. I, I'll be honest, um, I, I'd love to see it. It could never happen. Um, I, I'm assuming I'm happy to be corrected. The next two answers for the next two questions are going to come down to money. But why do you think point and click adventures are, they're, they're, still, they're still being made in the scene these days, but most big, big budget studios won't go near that particular genre. Why do you think that's the case? Um, it does come down to money. It's interesting. Uh, there have been a lot of, uh, first of all, uh, adventure games are dead is something that's been coming up, you know, over and over again since the, the mid 80s, at least. And it's certainly true that um, by the late 80s, they had a huge decline. And uh, sorry, by the late 90s, they had a huge decline. And um, for quite a while, they were were pretty much moribund. But uh, they've made a good comeback, and they never quite died out. There have always been a number of uh, very fervent players, and I find it very gratifying to see how so many indie developers are experimenting, not just with the sort of point and click, but putting pushing the genre in new directions, having interactive storytelling uh, experiment in different areas, which is really what we at LucasArts always thought of. The point and click was just a, a mechanism for interactive storytelling, not the end in itself. Um, but what happened, of course, uh, what literally doomed it was Doom and the rise of first-person shooters. They cost probably a quarter or even less to make because they didn't have um, the huge amount of artwork. They, they basically would come up with some very simple 3D background and repeat it over and over again for the most part. Um, and the action, they get lots of intense uh gratifying action that you could do over and over again, yeah. which we had to make fresh puzzles each time. 
And it was just very hard to compete with that. Uh, these days, a first person shooter has become quite expensive. And so, so creating a really good first person shooter game and a really good uh, story based you know, adventure game and of course, those two have grown together to a great degree in things like Uncharted and and some of the uh, uh, the Last of Us and the, those types of games. So, I think that there's room for those types of games now. But it was basically the old style in the '90s. It was really just an economic thing where yeah. much cheaper games were actually selling better, and nobody's going to spend more money to earn less money if they have the choice, you know, and they're running a business. No, good, good, and. Um, the final sort of questions for social media was simply why why didn't Harrison Ford voice Indy in Fate of Atlantis? Was there ever a chance? Was there ever negotiations, or was it just too expensive? So that that happened after I had left. Right. But um, I would say uh, I, it was certainly just a cost thing that mm. um, it, Lucas Arts, uh, Lucas Film, I should say, owned the rights to Indiana Jones as a character. But Harrison Ford owns the rights to his own depiction. So we never made um, an Indiana Jones in the game that looked exactly like Harrison Ford. I think on the, the cover of the, the, uh, the game of For Fate of Atlantis, we were able to and we had to get a special dispensation for that. Um, I forget exactly how it worked. I think maybe it was a, a, from a picture that he had shot for one of the other movies uh, that we had the rights to. But um, my sense is that uh, it just wasn't necessary, and it was way cheaper to get uh, the. I forget the name of the guy they used, but yeah. you know it worked out quite better that way uh, for us. And uh, yeah, I subsequently I worked on a game uh, at DreamWorks uh, called Chaos Island that was based on the Lost World, and we got the entire cast of the Lost World. Uh, you know Jeff Goldblum and um, uh, Vince Vaughn, and uh, uh, you know even um, oh. Uh, uh, Richard Attenborough, who's, you know, obviously a huge name, all to work on it. But that was all because Spielberg had directed the movie. And as a personal favor, he appealed to them to do it at scale. And I don't think we would have had the clout to do that with any of the other games. I actually think the uh, the voice act in, in Fate of Atlanta was top notch, by the way. Uh, I don't think it, it, you know, Harrison Ford would have been good, but the, I, can't, I forget his name now, but I think the person that did Indiana Jones done a stellar job, truthfully. Um, Look, no, I've really, really, really enjoyed this interview. It's been so interesting. I've got two sort of fun, sort of funny questions, wacky questions. Okay, sure. Up. But, but it's been such an honour, so really do appreciate it. Um, before I say goodbye then, so first question, if you could live in any of the video games you've ever worked on for one day, which game would you choose and why? Uh, you know, uh, actually living in those games, uh, that would be, you know, in some cases, pretty scary. Um, yeah. And uh, it's a tough one. Um, I would say uh, as long as I could, could be in the background, I think I'd, I'd enjoy being in the, the scum bar in Monkey Island yeah. and just sort of watching what was going on there because that, that certainly was, felt more like kind of being in Disney's Pirates of the Caribbean, you know, than uh, anything else. And as long as I didn't have to drink the grog, uh, you know, because uh, the ingredients of that are a bit suspect, uh, I think I, that'd probably be my, my best choice. Yeah, yeah. You could have a badge, couldn't you as well? Ask me about Fate of Atlantis. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. That would be my, that would be my role. <laughs> um, and I think actually the next question, you could literally have the same answer really, but if, if you, you've answered this on our text entry, Trippie, but if you could share a few drinks with any video game character, could be could be any character uh, that even works on obviously as well, who would you choose and why? Yeah, that's a that's a tougher one. I mean, because if I just go beyond the characters that I've, I've you know, worked on myself, um, you know, it's, it's such a, a huge range out there. Um, I don't know. It's interesting. I'm I'm of the school. You know, despite having worked on these story games, I tend to focus more on uh, the gameplay than the storytelling. That I love games like Civilization, for example, that really aren't character based. So um, if it really comes down to it, uh, you know, I I guess I. Sorry to be ducking out of this, but I, I cannot come up with a, a single character who I think that I would I would actually just enjoy hanging out with for, for their own sake. Even the, the Monkey Island ones, 
it's more fun to watch what happens to them, I think, True. than to, to usually actually the people around them, you know, often can meet rather unpleasant ends or, or uh, yeah, you know, be, have a rough time of it. But that's the best I can do for you. Sorry. And I, <laughs> I want to say this has been a lot of fun as well. Oh, thank you. Look, it's, honestly, it's been such a pleasure and it's a real honor. Um, I wish you all the luck in your future projects. No, keep us up to date. And um, yeah, I know our listeners are going to love it. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, pleasure talking to you. Thank you.